Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Well, hello church. It is great to be with you. My name is Ethan Magnus. I'm one of the ministers here and I am so glad uh, you are with us today. Uh, if you were with us last week, then you, like me, are probably still celebrating Student Takeover. Wasn't that amazing last week? Yeah! My goodness, I love Student Takeover. It's always one of my favorite Sundays of the year. They did such an amazing job. I, I really, I feel like I clearly can retire. Um, like, uh, I've, done, I've done my work, the next generation is secure, it's time for them to take over. No, it was amazing last weekend. Uh, if you missed it, go online. You're going to be impressed. They're really incredible. Uh, this week, let's see, I know some of you, you're in town visiting because for some of you all, it's a graduation weekend. Uh, congratulations, graduates. We've got like graduation weekend this weekend, and then another one next weekend, and the one after that, then we take a break, and then we've got like three. Uh, so lots of graduating going on right now, so congratulations. Uh, this was a graduation weekend for my family, so we're celebrating, and lots of you are as well. Uh, you're here on a good week. Uh, we're in the middle of a really interesting series uh, where we just are slowly reading through and learning from Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, so we're going to do that today. So uh, if, you, if you've got a Bible with you, turn it to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, if you look in the chair in front of you, every, about every other one has a Bible. You could grab a Bible there. You want to pull it up on your phone. If you don't know how to spell it, it's right there. You just type Ephesians 2 into Google. I bet the first link is going to be like Bible Gateway or something like that, and it will take you to the chapter that we are in today. Uh, Ephesians, we've been noticing, is a special book for lots of reasons, but one of the things that's special about it is that it is especially clear. Uh, most of Ephesians is very, very straightforward. You'll just be able to read it and understand what it is saying. And in particular, Ephesians chapter 2 is clear about the reality of our reality, like what is real in the world. And Ephesians 2 is just super clear about that. Uh, we started uh, three weeks ago with the, the beginning, uh, the first 10 verses, and we said the first 10 verses could be outlined like this. One through three talk about our individual reality without Christ. Four through seven, how Christ responds to that situation. Eight through 10, our individual reality with Christ. And we, we noticed that from those first three verses, we learned that apart from Christ, our reality is we are dead. We are spiritual corpses 
because of our offenses and sins. And we said this reality, it sort of breaks the illusion that we like to live with, which is that like we're okay, we, we can fix it, we can solve whatever problems we've got, we can solve them, the kind of the illusion of self-reliance that no, the reality is we, we can't fix it. Well, then in 4 through 7, two weeks ago, we talked about how does Christ respond. And we noticed that Christ responds. You can go look at the text. Try, don't take my word for it. It's right, very clear. 4 through 7, Christ responds with mercy, with love, and with life. This is how Christ responds to our reality of being spiritual corpses. And then last week, our students helped us see what is our new reality with Christ. So we, we looked at this together. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not by works. So no one can boast. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance so that we might walk in them. And our students just did a great job making clear our reality in Christ, that we are a new creation, God's masterpiece. And we are created to do good works. And as amazing as all that is, it's not the whole story. You might think it is. In fact, sometimes we limit the story of Christ to kind of just being about personal salvation. Like that's the whole story. You got to get saved and I got to get saved. Every single buddy has got to get saved. And that's the whole story. But there's more to the story than that. And we're gonna, what we're going to see as we keep reading is Paul doesn't just want to know how each one of us can be rescued by grace. Paul wants us to know how all of us together get rescued by grace. What we're going to discover is that God doesn't just want to save individual persons. God wants to save a people, to build a family, a nation, a kingdom, one united people. And the rest of our chapter talks about that, and that's where we're going to look today. Uh, we could outline the rest of the chapter in a very parallel way. 11 and 12, our collective reality without Christ. This is the situation we got without Jesus. 13 through 18, how does Christ respond to that reality? And 19 through 22, our new reality because of Christ. John Emmert, uh, next week, is going to tackle that third one. 19 through 22, our new reality without Christ. Uh, my family, we're all going to be gone for a couple weeks because we're going on a vacation to celebrate our graduate. Uh, but today, we're going to do those first two. We're going to talk about our collective reality without Christ and how Christ responds. And the good news is, like I said, the text is going to be super clear, so we're just going to go to the text and see what it tells us about our reality and about Christ's response. So let's start with question number one. While we read the text, just have this question in your mind. What does it tell me about our situation, our collective situation, without Jesus. So let's just go to the text and find out. I'm in Ephesians 2, verse 11. By now, you've got your Bible open. You got it up on your phone. It'll also be up on the screen. All right. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circum... Well, I actually have to pause here. I apologize. I've already told you like four times how super clear Ephesians was. And I promise every other verse we're going to read, you'll understand all on your own. But I probably have to explain a few things for just this one verse, okay? Uh, first of all, what's a Gentile? A Gentile is just everybody who isn't a Jew. So uh, God, throughout God's history, has been working with the descendant, the children of Abraham to bring grace into their lives that they might be a conduit of grace to the whole world. Uh, those are the Jews. Everybody else is Gentiles. Okay, well, what does circumcision have to do with it? Well, uh, traditionally, God's people, the Jews, would have all been circumcised. And in that period, 
almost everybody else wasn't. Uh, so male, Jewish males would have been circumcised uh, on the eighth day, and basically nobody else was. So it became this sort of sociological and religious marker that distinguished the two groups. So that's all this is about. Okay, so it says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles, meaning everybody who's not a Jew, by birth and called the uncircumcised, because they weren't circumcised, by those who call themselves the circumcision, that just means Jewish people, done in the body by human hands. Okay, everything else you'll be able to understand without me explaining, so I promise. Okay, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, that Christ is this promised Messiah, the anointed promised king that God was going to send to save and rule over God's people. You were separate from all that. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel. You were foreigners to the covenant of the promise. You were without hope. Remember, we're we're reading to paint what is our situation without Jesus. Here it is, just laid out for us. Without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, that was our situation without Christ, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier. Okay, we're learning something else about our situation without Christ. That we are divided by walls of hostility, the text says. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. Again, that tells us something else. If Jesus has to make peace, that must mean without Jesus, our natural situation is one of war. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death. Here is another reference to our natural situation. We are trapped in hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Okay, so what we learn about our situation, our collective reality without Jesus. We are cut off from the promises of God and we are divided by walls of hostility. That's our situation, according to Paul. What's interesting about this, though, is I expect I didn't even need to read Paul in order to make that argument. My guess is if I just started the sermon today, does anybody else notice that we're cut off from hope and divided by walls of hostility? My guess is everybody would have been like, yeah, that, that sounds about right. Humanity is hopeless and hostile. I mean, that's, that's what we all get, right? I mean, I, I, I remember like, you know, I remember once upon a time when it felt like everybody was like so hopeful about like we're going to figure, you know, humanity will eventually solve all its problems and we'll cure every disease and there'll be no more war and no more famine and everything's going to be great. I don't know anybody who thinks that way today. Humanity is, as we sort of always have been, we're sort of a mixed bag, right? You go back 20 years or 40 years or 80 years and some things are better. Like fewer people die of polio or cancer. That's great. Like some things are a lot better, you know? And some things aren't. Some things that we thought were getting better, turns out we're getting better just for some people. And they were getting worse for others. Some problems we didn't even know we had. Now suddenly they're big problems that we don't know what to do about. Every human institution, every human kingdom either fails or fades. And so far there haven't been any exceptions. Without Christ, we're sort of hopeless. And what about that other part where it keeps saying that we're divided by walls of hostility? Again, the Bible says so, but I don't think I need the Bible to get you to agree that, yeah, we are divided by walls of hostility. Every every social group you can name is all chopped up, right? Right? Sometimes it feels like the only thing that unites a social group is how they're divided from some other social group. Like the only thing they have to hold them together is how much they hate somebody else. 
And if it weren't for that, they'd just splinter into more and more pieces as everything got sliced up. We see this in our personal lives, right? Somebody does us wrong, so we hold a grudge and we build a wall. Maybe it's a wall of gossip. We talk bad about them. Or maybe it's a wall of bitterness. We think bad about them. Or maybe it's a wall of separation. We just remove ourselves from them. But either way, it's a wall of hostility because that's the only kind of wall people know how to build. Or, or maybe it, like we see this happen in marriages and in families where somebody disappoints you. And so you're going to like do the silent treatment, right? You build up a wall of silence. And you're like, it's not a wall of hostility. It's just a wall of silence. Ask the person on the other side of that wall what kind of wall they think you built. They think you built a wall of hostility because that's the only kind of wall we know how to build. We think about this globally, right? You go to Google Maps and you start to zoom out when all the lines show up that tell you where one nation starts and another nation stops, right? Every one of those lines is just a historical record of where the last war ended and the next war starts. That's what those lines are. They're walls of some past hostility, some present hostility, some future hostility. And we see right now, don't we? It's very easy to see. You get it on your, your phones and your social media and on the news. We see all the people who live on other, one side or the other of these walls of hostility. And I know we read the news and the news tells us about the soldiers and the generals and the prime ministers. The news tells us about, you know, and we say, oh, those are the good guys and those are the bad guys. But, but if we pause for a second, we know, we know that most of the people on either side of those walls. Like, you know this, right? Most of the people on either side of those walls, they're not good guys or bad guys. They're just children and their parents trying not to go to bed hungry. Like, you know that, right? Like, almost everybody in the world is just trying, not, just trying to get a good night's sleep and a full belly. And we look at these walls of hostility and we play political games. But everybody, almost everybody on both sides is just a hungry family trying to get a good night's sleep. Our political situation. Again, I don't need the Bible to tell you that our current political situation is just one wall of hostility after another. Increasingly dividing a people until we all hate everybody. Right? Right? Every time I talk to somebody about politics, it's fascinating. To talk. I don't do it often because, you know, I don't want the world to be a super awkward place. But you do, I do it every once in a while. And it's almost everybody I know, no matter what your political opinions are, almost everybody shares this one trait. We're all embarrassed by the political discourse in our nation. Like we find it humiliating. And yet it persists, Right? We, we, some of us are old enough to have the vague memory, just we can barely remember when we used to argue about policy with people that we treated with respect. Like just vaguely, like barely. Some of you young people don't know that's possible. Ask a gray hair. Like, did you ever argue about policy and still treat people with respect? And they'll be like, yeah, that actually was kind of how we did it for like decades. It was like, man, we really disagreed on policy, but... Then we treated each other with dignity after. It was, I don't know what we did. What do we do now? We build walls. Only kind of wall we know how to build. Walls of hostility. Study after study shows that most people don't have a good friend with whom they disagree on politics. And they definitely haven't shared a meal and tried to bless the other person and love the other person and listen to the other person. And sometimes we even do this in the church. We get so good at building walls of hostility that we do it here together. Man, I wish I could say it never happens, but again, like I said, I don't even need the Bible to make this point. You all know it. We have disagreements And we do not disagree in love. We do not prefer one another in love. 
We do not humble ourselves and lift up the other. But instead, we tear people down and we twist their words and we make them look like a fool because we're trying to win the argument rather than love the person. That's what a wall of hostility looks like. And Paul says, that's the world we live in. That's just our reality without Jesus. And most of us want Jesus to respond to our hopeless and hostile world. In fact, most of us have a particular response that is how we want Jesus to respond. We want Jesus to seize all the walls of hostility and make sure that our side wins. Right? Like That's our first instinct. Is Jesus, could you make sure that my side of the hostility is victorious? And if you ever have that desire for that to be how Jesus responds, you are in good company. Because that was the general desire of God's people as they awaited a Messiah. In fact, part of reason it was so hard for people to recognize that Jesus was the anointed king that God sent to save us was because he didn't come to destroy their enemies. I was... I got to teach Sunday school with the anchor class last week, and we talked a little bit about these false messianic expectations, and we read a little bit from a poem. This is from about 100 years before Jesus. This was a a popular Jewish poem about 100 years before Jesus. Here's what it says. Look, Lord, raise up for them their king, the son of David, to rule over your servant Israel. Undergird him with strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from all Gentiles, to trample them in destruction. In wisdom and in righteousness, allow him to drive sinners from their inheritance and to smash the arrogant Gentiles. That's what they wanted. They wanted the the Messiah to come and smite somebody. And I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I'm just curious. Am I the only person in the room who ever wished Jesus would smite somebody? I don't think I am. And I know, I know some of you never have, and we're all very impressed. Um, but have you, ever, have you ever wanted Jesus just to smite somebody? I mean, not a lot. Just a little smiting, a mini smiting, you know? Just maybe car trouble on the way to work. I mean, you know, don't go crazy, you know? I mean, otherwise, on the other hand, if God were to smite him, I mean, God's sovereign, that wouldn't be on me, right? That'd be on God, right? Like, like it's God, I'm not saying I want you to it. I'm just saying if you did, I would give you glory. That's all I'm saying, you know? Right? You know? Just a little mini smiting, you know? This is what happens when we see the world through the walls of hostility. And I want to be super clear. Most of the walls of hostility through which you see the world, you didn't even build. They're not even your walls. You just grew up in a place. And somebody taught you, how do you know where you are? And they said, you know where you are by looking at the walls. We're on this side of the wall, and they're on that side of the wall. We're on this side of the wall, and they're on that side of the wall. We're on this side of the wall, and they're on that side of the wall. And we used to be on the same side of the wall as Uncle Joe, but before you were born, before you, we built a wall, and now Uncle Joe's on that side of the wall, and we're on this side of the wall. And someday when you're older, we'll tell you how we built the wall and why we built the wall, but for now it's enough for you to know that Uncle Joe's on the wrong side of the wall. You didn't even build the walls. I mean, you built your share. You've added to it. But most of the walls you didn't even build. And sometimes we hope for a Messiah. We hope for an anointed king who will see the world across the walls of hostility the same way we do and will work for their destruction. But that is not how Jesus responds to the reality of our human situation. We are a hopeless people. We are a hostile people. Let's find out what Jesus does. We're going to go back to the same text now with a different question. How does Jesus respond? 
We're going to read it together. Pay attention. Again, you, won't need to, you need me to explain it. It's super clear. Look for how Jesus responds to our hopeless and hostile situation. Verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth are called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope, without God in the world. Here comes Jesus' response. But now... In Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near. How did he pull it off? By the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He has made the two groups one. Has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of the hostility. How did he do that? By setting aside in his flesh the law, all the rules, and you kept the rules, and I didn't keep the rules, and if you don't keep the rules the way I think you should keep the rules, then you must be on the other side of the wall. He just set it aside. His purpose, oh, pay attention to this. Anytime the Bible tells you the purposes of God, look at this. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two and thus make peace. We think that the path to peace is from my side to win and their side to lose. Jesus says the path to peace is to make one new people out of two. How does he do it? In one body, he reconciles both of them to God by dying on a cross by which he puts to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Jesus makes one humanity reconciled together by tearing down the walls of hostility by dying. And he reconciles all of us to God by making us children of the promise. And if we are children of the same father, that makes us brothers and sisters. Next week, John's going to explore this new reality that we have in Christ as one united people. But right now, I just want to focus on how Jesus addresses our problem. Because you've got to know that Jesus' response to our hopelessness and our hostility is to die. That's his strategy. To die on a cross. In his sacrifice for others, I want to give you two words to help you explain what the death of Christ accomplishes to reunite us, okay? Two words. In the sacrifice on the cross, Jesus establishes his kingship and our kinship. That's what he proves on the cross. He proves that he's king and we're related. Let me tell you what I mean by kingship. Christ, because of his death on the cross, is now by God's power enabled to reign eternally as king over an eternal kingdom. And everyone who trusts in Christ, go back and read it, it's in their text, is made a citizen of this eternal kingdom. All human nations, all human governments, all human powers, all human principalities will eventually fade or fail. And on their way to fading or failing, they'll fight with one another over the scraps of this earth. Only the reign of Christ is eternal and eternally sufficient such that no war is needed. His kingship gives us an eternal hope. The second thing the cross does, though, is kinship. By the blood of Christ, those who trust in Christ are made children of the one true God. And because we are children of the same father, we are siblings. I remember as a kid, growing up with my brother, occasionally we'd start fighting. More often than occasionally, quite frankly. But we knew 
If one of my parents walked into the room, the fight had to stop. Why was that? Well, that's because the priority of our relationship with our mother or father took precedence than whatever squabble had broken out between us. Sometimes they didn't even need to say a word. I remember so many times we'd be fighting over a toy or who got the TV remote or whatever it was. And we'd be just going at it. And my mom or dad would just walk in the room and they would say, are you boys fighting? And we would say, no. And on the one hand, that's a lie, right? On the other hand, by the time they asked, we weren't fighting. And why weren't we fighting? It's because in that moment, we were shocked into the recognition that our relationship with our mom or our relationship with our dad dictated the nature of our relationship with one another. We were not actually, we were not sovereign over the nature of our relationship with one another. Our parents were sovereign over that relationship. Now, sometimes we didn't come to a realization quite that fast. And they would need to say, boys, Stop fighting. And what do we do? We ask them to join the fight. We say, oh, but he did. Oh, but they did. Let me tell you about the wall of hostility we have built and why I'm on this side and why they're on that side so that you will know that the right course of action is for you to join my side of the wall and help me destroy my enemy. but they knew better. Oh, sure, discipline was sometimes needed, but the discipline was because we had breached our parents' law, not because they somehow joined the fight. And the fight didn't end because one of us won. The fight ended because our parents declared it over. That is how kinship, the recognition of our spiritual kinship with all those God seeks to save, which is everybody, changes the way we see the walls of hostility. The walls of hostility that we have built are now, they stand as an affront to the authority of Jesus, as a denial of the meaningful power of his death. I want to just give you an illustration, a couple of illustrations about how these principles of kinship and kingship will change the way you approach the walls of hostility in your life. We're going to start real personal, right? I, earlier, I gave the example of one of the walls of hostility we build is to hold a grudge. Now, I know most of you turned to your neighbor and said, what's a grudge? I've never held one of those. Okay, so you don't know. But, but the rest of us, we know what it's like to hold a grudge, okay? So I just want you to dial into that. Some of you won't have to work very hard because you're nursing a grudge right now. Right now, you are mad at somebody, and for the sake of argument, we're gonna assume you have good reason to be mad at them, okay? We're gonna assume they did you wrong. They broke a promise or did something to you they shouldn't have done. We're gonna assume you got good reason for now. And so what did you do? You built a wall. Maybe it was a wall of gossip. You told a bunch of people. Or maybe you're better than that. Maybe you built a wall of self-righteousness. That's, we like that wall, don't we? I can't believe they did that. I would never do that. You know, whatever. But you built your wall. Now, I want to explore the logic of kingship and kinship and how it applies to the grudge that you are presently holding. Okay? So I want you to dial in to a grudge that you're holding or to a grudge you have recently held. This is you and Jesus. I want you to apply this logic. Imagine you and Jesus are having a conversation about your grudge, okay? You're having a conversation about your grudge, and you say this to Jesus. You say, you know, they did me wrong. And Jesus says, yeah, you're right. They really did. Uh, Believe me, I know, too, because I had to die for that sin. And you're like, yeah, but, but they owe me. They owe me. And Jesus says, boy, you are right. They really did. I had to shed my blood to pay back their debt. 
And you say, but well, you don't understand, Jesus. When I look at them, all I can see is what they did to me and how, who, who they are and who they've revealed themselves to be, Jesus, by their actions. That's all I can see. And Jesus says, I get it. I actually have a little trouble seeing them too. All I see is that they've been covered by my blood. That's, that's all I see. And, and you say, but, but Jesus, I... I I got to stay mad anyway. And Jesus says, really? Me dying on a cross because of their sin? Shedding my blood to pay back their debt? Naming them as your brother or sister? All the while, I was doing the exact same thing for you. That's not enough? You still want to go to war? I paid their debt. I died for their sin. I named them as your sister or brother. That's the logic of a Christian holding a grudge. We are denying the kingship of Jesus and our kinship with those Jesus loves. The cross tears down the wall of hostility because it announces that we are citizens of the same kingdom. So how could we go to war when we are children of the same father? This is why, instead of building walls of hostility, what does the Bible say when someone sins against us? It's not that it never happens. The Bible just says, run to them. With what goal? To, get, to pay them back? To make sure they say they're sorry? To, to make, no, run to them that you might be reconciled. How does the logic of kingship and kinship function collectively? Well, how about this? How does the logic of kingship and kinship function in an election year? Right? Did you know it was an election year? I know. We're all trying to avoid it, but soon we won't be able to. Okay? I know. I know. It's an election year. And elections create walls. You vote for this person, you vote for that person, you kind of hold your nose and vote, you're really excited about your vote, or whatever it is, right? You know? They create walls. And because the only kind of walls we people know how to make are walls of hostility, they create walls of hostility. And right now, one of our cultural gifts, every culture has strengths and weaknesses. We are in a moment of great cultural strength when it comes to creating walls of hostility. We're amazing at it right now. We know how to build a wall and go to war just like that. Even some Christian voices want to magnify the hostility and call upon the name of Jesus to destroy their enemies. Well, let's be crystal clear. Jesus did not come to defeat your human enemies. He came to save them, to heal them, to love them. He came to to reconcile them and you that you might be siblings of the same father, citizens of the same kingdom. And if you think, don't take my word for it. Like I said, Ephesians is super clear. Look it with me again. His purpose, whose purpose? Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. This is Christ's purpose. And so when we promote dehumanization, hostility, and hatred, With those whom we disagree, we are working against the purposes of Christ. So by all means, please, 
advocate for whatever policies you think will help our nation and bless as many people throughout the whole world. Let's all do that. Let's all advocate for policies that will provide the maximum amount of blessing to the whole world of God's creation. That sounds smart to me. But ignore the voices that promote hostility and hatred and dehumanization because these are not the voices of your king. He died to save those people. And in his death, he tears down the wall of hostility. Not making one victorious humanity and one losing humanity, but one new humanity out of two. A humanity under the kingship of Jesus, enjoying the kinship of all because we have the same Father. And how does he do it? By what mechanism does Jesus accomplish this desperately needed miracle? He dies on a cross. That's how he does it. He dies on a cross. That's why Christian worship is centered around the meal of communion. A meal that remembers a death. We're going to share in that meal together in just a second. If you got elements on the way in, you are ready. If, like me, you forgot to get them on the way in, if you just put your hand up, we'll have ushers moving around, and they'll bring it to you. I'm hoping somebody can start with me, because I forgot it. Thank you. And then keep your hand up, and someone will bring uh, the elements so you can share in the meal. I, I could imagine that it might seem morbid, to you, it might seem a little morbid to center a worship service around a remembrance of a death. I get that. I get that. But maybe if you just paid attention to Ephesians, you can see why it doesn't seem morbid to me. Because I know what that death did. It paid my debt and yours. It gave me a new identity in Christ. So when God looks at me, he doesn't see a rebel. He sees a child. But more than that, Christ in his death put to death the hostility of humanity and gave us hope for an eternal kingdom. That was his purpose, after all. The purpose of the cross was to create in himself one new humanity out of two. Make peace in his one body to reconcile all of us to God. And put to death on the cross the hostility that divides us. And so right now, if you will, if you're trusting in Christ right now, would you please share with me in the bread The bread broken, like we are without Jesus. Broken for our sake, we take now together. Grateful for his love and sacrifice by which we are reconciled to God and therefore reconciled to one another. And now we share together the cup. His blood poured out from us for us. And as we take together, we recognize that by his blood we are made children of our Heavenly Father. And therefore, when we look around the world, we see siblings, not enemies. Let's pray together. Jesus, we still need you. We still live in a world marked by hopelessness and hostility. We need you, Jesus. We need your lordship, 
your kingship established on the cross when you were made the king of an eternal kingdom and we by your grace were invited to become citizens we lay our rebel weapons down God and we seek to be made part of your kingdom recognizing that we also lay down our weapons of war against others as we are united in your family God, we need you. We need not just your kingship, but we need your blood by which we are made kin to one another. Reconciled to God and therefore the first chance we ever had in all of human history to be reconciled to one another. As our relationship to you takes precedence and priority over our enmity with one another. We cling to you and reach out to you, God. We pray, Lord Christ, accomplish this in our hearts, and then another, and then another, and then another, that the whole world might know your peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.